Hey there, Cedar Valley. I'm Mike Menon, and welcome to the newest edition of the Arts Overlook. Each episode, we look at different arts and entertainment stories circulating around the Cedar Valley. This edition, we'll meet up with local musician Austin Taft, check out the newest exhibit at the UNI Gallery of Art, and take a glimpse into the past at Prairie Lakes. All this and more coming up next. Art is thriving in the Cedar Valley. It's everywhere. But if you don't know where to look, you could miss it. This is your local arts perspective. This is the Arts Overlook. The Austin Taft soundtrack has been performing around the Cedar Valley for nearly five years now, and we have the opportunity to catch up with Austin. The Cedar Valley is full of local musicians trying to make a name for themselves. However, most of these musicians don't carry a backstory quite like Austin Taft. Growing up in various parts of the United States, Austin Taft latched onto music at a very young age, hoisting a pair of drumsticks at just four years old. By age 14, Taft was shredding on the guitar and was beginning down a path that was surrounded by music. But I picked up guitar when I was around 14, um, really just because I was listening to a lot of music that other people my age weren't quite getting into. I was listening to a lot of 1970s British progressive rock songs that stretched to 10, 20, 25 minutes and things like that. Went through several mood changes and all of that. Um, and I've always enjoyed a good bit of you know, three chord pop catchy music, but it's kind of the balance between the two that really interests me. One band that really stood out for Taft was Genesis that featured the renowned Phil Collins on drums and vocals. Taft first discovered Genesis at age 8 and they've been playing for over 40 years. What stood out about Genesis was their willingness to cover more than one genre. Taft grew to love Genesis and they were a huge part in developing his style of music he plays today. When you look at their catalog of several albums, um, they really do range from the three minute pop songs to the 10, 20 minute progressive rock songs. And so that definitely had a big influence early on and allowed me to sort of have a gauge of what I really enjoyed in an album and what I thought I could put into my own records when it came time to do that. As the 80s passed, the 90s introduced Taft to a new style of music called grunge rock. That new style became very popular and record labels were signing new bands left and right with hopes of finding the next Nirvana. A lot of bands were picked up by all these different labels. They'd put out maybe one record and then for one reason or another the thing would just kind of tank. And there are obviously you know, some that you know, Alice in Chains and Soundgarden and all those groups did, did manage to make it work, but I mean you're talking hundreds of hundreds of hundreds of hundreds of thousands of thousands of bands that maybe put out music that in some ways was just as good, it just didn't quite work. And now the CDs are, are out of print um, and they just weren't promoted properly or things like that. So there's a lot of that that I'm still discovering that I really enjoy and there's something about that sort of 90s period that really works for me on a number of levels. Today you can see all these inspirations coming through to Taft in his music. Taft continues to grow as a musician and felt he was ready to take the next step where he would create a studio album. Taft had over 100 songs he had written since 2000 and he had to chop that down to a much smaller list of songs to put onto his first album. The studio album wasn't the only step in mind for Taft. He also wanted to create a band to take to the live stage called the Austin Taft Soundtrack. I put the song list together and started looking around for people and I met uh, both Dave and Joel through mutual friends. Um, we rehearsed for a while and the aim was to rehearse to the point that when you did your first show it didn't look like it was your first show. It was supposed to look like you had been around for a while and people would go, oh, how come we haven't heard of you guys? Because this looks, you know, experienced and all that. Um, so we started playing live around 2000, early 2009, uh, but we're rehearsing for several months prior to that. As the band continued to grow popular around the Cedar Valley and other locations around the Midwest, they began to work on their studio album titled The War of Songs of Light Against the Songs of Darkness that was released in 2012. The album is a little bit heavier than their past studio albums, and songs range in length from 3.5 minutes to 10 minutes. The writing process is very unique for all the songs, but one song stands out in Taft's mind. There's a song on the new record uh, called Monster and the, it's most commonly known for its sort of really, really repetitive bass line. And uh, I had just watched, I think, a, a Jaco Pistorius instructional video of some sort of a bass legend. And um, he was talking about the importance of learning the melody on the bass, because not a lot of people know the melody to a song on the bass instrument. They're used to playing the bass part. And I thought, well, that's an interesting idea, I and mean, it seems like common sense, but again, like, why don't I give that a go? So I started just going through random songs and learning melodies, but it was mostly stuff and maybe other bands I'd played in and things where I didn't write the music, but I enjoyed the melody. And um, toying around with the melodies and just different songs, I wound up getting this bass line that was uh, monster. And so then once I had the bass line, 
Um, I recorded that, came up with this guitar lick, and then put together about a minute and a half demo and just looped it over and over and we started singing over it and recording everything. And the words that came out, at least the main hook, you know, I'm a monster, I am, are you scared that you should be, all that sort of stuff, just sounded good. It sang well and sometimes you write words that maybe look good on paper, then you try to sing them and syllables fall in certain ways or um, things like that. Today, the Austin Taft soundtrack has made their home in the Cedar Valley, playing at venues such as Spicoli's and Cup of Joe. They have even won the Battle of the Bands event that is featured at the Hub both times that they have entered the contest. However, the Austin Taft soundtrack plays in areas all over Iowa, such as Des Moines, Iowa City, Marshalltown, and other major cities. At the end of the day, Taft just wants his music to be heard by people who would get excited by the same style of music he does. First and foremost, I try to make records that uh, I really enjoy. I feel like if you know, I can make a record that I really get excited by, and it's, I'll quote DJ Premier, I make what I like to buy, then I know there's an audience for it, because if I'm excited by it, there have to be other people who can get excited by it. Now, the diversity of the records, given that it bounces a lot between fast songs, slow songs, um, heavy songs, light songs, uh, serious songs, and not so serious songs. Um, some people prefer, you know, one mood type music and things like that, um, but, uh, when this sort of thing, especially if you're writing about really deep subjects, because I have love songs in my catalog for sure, but it can touch people if it finds the right people. And uh, the aim is to have the music find its audience uh, that it's intended to For those interested in learning more about Austin Taft or the Austin Taft soundtrack, they can check out their website called austintaft.com where they can find out information about upcoming shows and ways to listen to their music. You can also find them on Facebook as well if you search for Austin Taft soundtrack. If you're looking for a good local live act, the Austin Taft soundtrack is one band you should definitely keep an eye out for. Austin Taft's latest album, War of the Songs of Light Against the Songs of Darkness, can be found on iTunes as well as his website, austintaft.com. School is back in session at the University of Northern Iowa, and that means that the UNI Gallery of Art is back up with a brand new permanent art collection as well as a temporary exhibit titled Reverb, Recent Abstraction and Painting. The University of Northern Iowa Gallery of Art will present a new exhibition, Reverb, Recent Abstraction and Painting, from Monday, January 14th through Saturday, March 2nd, in the south wing of the Camerick Art Building. Uh, the current exhibit in the UNI Gallery of Art is Reverb, Current Abstraction and Painting. It was curated by one of our professors here in the department, Kenneth Hall, and he gathered about eight different artists from across the country who are working in different ways in abstraction, some of them geometric abstraction, uh, like in the work of Mary Lauby and Deborah Zlotsky, and some abstract kind of ex abstract expressionist work like you see here in Dana Saulnier's work. And so we've got a wide range of what people think is abstract or uh, the kind of work that they're doing right now that fits into that kind of category. This group invitational exhibition features new work by Scott Anderson from Albuquerque, New Mexico, Jimmy Baker from Cincinnati, Ohio, Christy Blizzard from Lubbock, Texas, the late Megan Dirks of Sioux City, Iowa, Mary Lowby from Iowa City, Iowa, among others. These artists have been assembled because of their passionate investigations into expressive mark making and gestural iconography. That's the exciting thing about the UNI Gallery of Art. A lot of the artists that we're working at are showing at the Whitney, they're showing at um, the Walker in Minneapolis, they're showing in uh, exhibition spaces, uh, large galleries in the, in the, you know, throughout the United States and some, in some cases in Europe as well. So these artists are working artists they're getting their, their um, new bodies of work into different spaces all over the country. And we all, um, one of our um, objectives is to draw them to this space as well. Assistant Professor Kenneth Hall stated that contemporary abstract painting shows tendencies toward figuration as a response to the senses. The subject of seeing and the senses generally is a theme in the work of these artists who bring unique viewpoints and the aesthetics to show a robust variety in contemporary abstract painting. The term reverb connotes music and the effect of enhancing sound by way of technology, making it more spacious, more layered, and more dynamic. As you walk through the space, you're not jarred, but you're brought to a new idea every time you walk another two or three feet. So as you enter the gallery space, you see Jimmy Baker's artwork, the smaller abstract, kind of abstract expressionist work, and then immediately you see these really large abstract expressionist inspired works by Dana Saulnier. 
and then you walk into another room and you begin to see how that abstraction has gotten kind of more figurative. Uh, uh, something else that's happening in the art world is abstraction that becomes figurative. And then as you walk through the space toward the end, you start seeing um, geometric abstraction. And so there's a progression of what you see as you go so that you um, have an experience. You're learning something as you go. You're adding to your experience um, of the artwork that you're looking at. And then by the end of the exhibition, you have seen a wide range of what abstraction can, can mean to artists in the world today. The exhibit that you see right now is up for about two months. Most of our exhibitions last about a month. So we have rotating exhibits coming in and out constantly. And the first gallery is a permanent art collection exhibition and it's up for the entire semester. The exhibition that's currently up is one that I curated myself. It's called The Individual is the Illusion. And it's several works from our collection that have something to do with art and globalization. The Individual is the One Illusion will run through Saturday, May 11th. Students from Assistant Professor of Art Elizabeth Sutton's Art and Globalization Seminar will provide text about each piece of art. All events are free and open to the public. The public um, gets a chance to come to a space with professional artists, professional uh, a setting for artists who are doing contemporary artwork, artists who are making artwork right now. That's something that you might find in other um, venues here in the Cedar Valley, but that's what we're devoted to. It's our mission to bring emerging artists contemporary artists and mid-career artists who are doing work right now. That's what we want to do is to create an, an exciting environment for brand new artwork. Gallery hours are from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. Monday through Thursday, noon to 5 p.m. Friday and Saturday. For more information visit the website below or call 319-273-3095. Be sure to swing by the UNI Gallery of Art to check out these fantastic exhibits. The Reverb exhibit will be available until March 3rd, and the Permanent Art Collection will be available until May 11th. We've been battling some crazy weather the past few weeks. Last summer we shot an art montage at the Prairie Lakes when the weather was much warmer outside. Here at the Arts Overlook, we want to remind you that spring is just around the corner. We hope you enjoyed the art montage and are looking forward to the summer. That is all we have for you on this edition of The Arts Overlook. Thanks for watching.